Tag team wrestling is one of the cornerstones of professional wrestling, as integral as a chair shot, a suplex, or an insane Scott Steiner promo. It's a feature that sets wrestling aside from other combat sports, real and predetermined, and it's believed that tag team matches have been part of the show since the 1950s, allowing for dynamics and maneuvers not possible in traditional one-on-one -on -one bouts. As a plot device, tag team wrestling has been used to make new stars, further storylines, and even led to full-on riots. As a match type, tag team wrestling has produced some of the greatest in-ring action ever seen. Everyone does tag wrestling differently. There's the high-octane multi-man matches of Mexican Lucha Libre, the hard-hitting, often lengthy bouts of Japanese tag wrestling, and of course traditional American tag wrestling, which itself has taken on many guises throughout the years. Today, we are focusing on WWE, who have had a love-hate relationship with tag teams throughout its history. From the highs of the late 80s and the Attitude Era to the lows of, well, you'll see. But regardless of Vince McMahon's thoughts on tag wrestling on any given day, WWE has always featured tag titles, a distinguished prize for the best duos to fight for. There have been three major men's tag team championships in modern day WWE. The historic World Tag Team Championship, the Raw Tag Team Championship, formerly known as the WWE Tag Titles, and the new kid on the block, the SmackDown Tag Team Championship. Between the three, there have been 155 championship winning combos dating back to 1984, and Muggins here is going to rank them. Wish me luck. To stop me going from abs Absolutely berserk though, we are only ranking Reigns from when Vince McMahon Jr. split from the NWA and went solo as the promoter with the biggest grapefruits in town. Why? Because it's a good place to start. Besides, before then it's a bit murky at times, and the NWA tag scenes in its heyday were an absolute nightmare to fathom without WWE being involved. So before we kick off, here is a nod of respect to such teams as the Wild Samoans, the Moon Dogs, Mr. Fuji and Professor Tanaka, the Valiant Brothers, and the work of Tony Gurria. Dominic DiNucci and Chief J Strongbow. Oh, and one last Pachiti point before we get going. This list is ranking how these teams ran as champions, not the overall quality of any given team's career as a whole, as especially with babyfaces, often the best work is done chasing the belts rather than holding the gold. I'm Adam Pachiti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and this is all of the WWE Tag Team Champions ranked from worst to best. Join us, join us. See what I did there? Number 140, every team that was just two feuding single stars bundled together. Is there a worse trope in WWE than throwing two feuding singles wrestlers together for a quick run with the straps before everything goes tits up? For a start, it devalues the tag division, as a team that knows each other from front to back should never lose to two bellends who can't even agree on what to have for lunch. And second of all, it's been done to death. I never want to see it again. Bugger off. WWE might as well skip the match and put a title screen on telly that says tag teams are actually rubbish, but stick around because singles wrestlers are coming up. You love them. Number 139, every team that was only put together in order to have them split and feud. Similar to the previous, but slightly less annoying. Now, this is not the same as a tag team splitting up after a long run together. Heck no. Because at the end of the day, we all love a good tag team breakup angle, but only when we've had time to become invested. Throwing two people people together with nothing better to do just to split them up in a month isn't exactly stellar, is it? The problem with this and the prior entry is that they both treat the tag titles as props and nothing else. Some will say that's all title belts are, props, but to the audience, they're a massive reason to tune in and care. I mean, the Mega Powers didn't need the tag titles to make their breakup mean something. Did Al Snow and Mankind really need them? 138, Braun Strowman and Nicholas. And just when I thought I was done about the tag titles being devalued props. Braun Strowman, hulking cartoon character come to life, the man who loves grappling hooks, cake, and unbridled carnage. Who could possibly team with such a force of nature and bring chaos to the tag division? That's right, Nicholas, a terrified 10-year-old boy. The pair winning the tag titles at WrestleMania 34 was both funny and memorable, but come on now, we have to draw a line somewhere. The pair relinquished the titles after roughly 24 hours, 
because Nicholas had to go back to school, making the whole affair a waste of time. Number 134, Men on a Mission. Take two tablespoons of fun, mix in a dollop of Technicolor, and add to it two huge lads and a below average rapper. Voila, you have Men on a Mission. Big lovely lads they may have been, but MOM were never supposed to be tag champs. At a live event in England in 1994, the huge Mabel fell on Pierre of the Quebecers, legitimately stunning him and causing him to take the three counts rather than kick out as scripted. This was obviously never the plan. Men on a Mission lost the titles at the next show back to the Quebecers. Number 136, The Rock and The Undertaker. Now, on paper, a team of The Rock and American Badass Undertaker sounds as awesome as it does strange, but truth be told, they only teamed together because they had literally nothing better to do for a fortnight. The Great One and The Redneck One were both unsuccessful in the Armageddon six-man Hell in a Cell match, so to bounce back, defeated Edge and Christian for the straps on Raw. One day later, they dropped the belts back to ENC on SmackDown thanks to shenanigans from special guest referee WWE Champion Kurt Angle. Absolutely pointless this, and a further kick in the face to the true solo stars of the WWE. Number 135, The 123 Kid and Bob Holly. In 1994, two dudes with attitudes split, vacating the tag titles in the process. I have a plan, said Vince McMahon. We'll have a tournament, and the smoking guns can win the titles. Unfortunately, though, kayfabe injuries occurred and the guns were out. Luckily, new generation dorks Bob Sparkplug Holly and the 123 Kid were just hanging around, so they were cobbled together, thrown into the tournament, and somehow won the thing. They even defeated the much bigger Bam Bam Bigelow and Tatonka in the finals at Royal Rumble 1995. However, the next night on Raw, the smoking guns beat them for the belts. Easy come, easy go. Number 134, Chief Morley and Lance Storm. Sick of making blue moves, Movies, and also sick of being a member of Right to Censor, Val Venus morphed into Sean Morley and was made Chief of Staff by Raw GM Eric Bischoff. Power quickly went to his head. After William Regal and Lance Storm had to vacate the tag titles due to Regal being injured, Morley simply declared that he and Storm were the new champs. They successfully defended against Kane and Rob Van Dam on the Sunday night heat before WrestleMania 19, but lost to the pair the next night on Raw. Number 133, The 123 Kid and Marty Jannetty. Not content with being the Marty Jannetty of the Rockers, Marty Jannetty was also the Marty Jannetty of Marty Jannetty and the 123 Kid. Still, they did what the Rockers couldn't, which is reign as WWE Tag Team Champions. No, this win here isn't officially recognized, it doesn't count. Ending the Quebecers' 119 day reign on an episode of Raw, Jannetty and Kid rode high as the babyface team that would not say die, until they said die at a house show just one week later. Kid would have more tag success in the Attitude Era, but this was one and done for Marty. Number 132, Ric Flair and Roddy Piper. Ric Flair and Roddy Piper, two of the biggest stars of the 1980s. One hell of a potential team right there. Unfortunately, this was the Ric Flair and Roddy Piper of 2006 that actually held tag gold. It happened at Cyber Sunday, with Flair and a partner decided by the audience taking on the Spirit Squad. Piper was voted into the match, over Sergeant Slaughter and Dusty Rhodes, then won the gold. I mean, not only were these guys semi-retired, but they weren't even a team. Regardless, the whole affair only lasted eight days until Rated RKO absolutely demolished them for the belts. A concerto took Piper out before the bell, leaving Flair on his own. Even in retirement, Piper wouldn't take a pin. Respect. Number 131, Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie. Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie won the tag titles in one of the greatest WrestleMania tag matches ever, defeating the New Age Outlaws in a dumpster match at Mania 14. The first and only title in WWE for Terry Funk, the wrestling legend was given a truly historic, lengthy title reign of one day. The hairy hardcore boys were stripped of the belts on a technicality before losing a cage match to the Outlaws the next night on Raw. Still, that dumpster match was good at least, eh? Number 130, The Godwins. Henry O. God Godwin and Phineas I. Godwin were pig farmers, but pig farmers that wrestled for money. It was the mid-90s, this is just how it was. Shortly after debuting in 1996, they lost the finals of the tag team tournament at WrestleMania 12 to the Body Donners, but would soon beat them for the titles, reigning as champions for a long and illustrious seven days. But don't worry, Hog and Pig had a second run with the straps in 1997, for two days before the Legion of Doom pummeled them for the gold. Number 129, Rico and Rikishi. 
At Judgment Day 2002, Rico was forced to team against allies Billy and Chuck for the tag titles, pairing up with Rikishi. Lo and behold, they actually won. Then, two weeks later, Rico turned on Rikishi so Billy and Chuck could win the titles again. A waste of time, frankly, and had it not been for this video, I doubt many of us would have remembered it. Number 128, Booker T and Test. Right, hands up, who remembers Booker T and Test being a tag team? All right, put your hand down, Booker. The two started hanging out during the invasion and surprisingly beat the Brothers of Destruction for the WCW tag team titles, but would drop them to the Hardy Boys a little under two weeks later. But the two dusted themselves off and defeated the Rock and Chris Jericho for the WWE tag team titles. Again, they dropped them to the Hardy Boys after a fortnight. Interestingly, this was the most successful run of Test WWE career since TNA never won the big ones. I'm as shocked as you. Number 120. Rey Mysterio and Batista. A spin on the rivals tagging together to belittle an entire division, world champion Batista and Rey teamed together as a precursor to Rey's rotten world heavyweight title reign. Defeating Eminem for the straps, the two dedicated the win to Eddie Guerrero. The champs then lost a non-title match against Kane and Big Show, Rey took the pin, before dropping them back to Eminem after a reign of two weeks. Surprisingly, it was Big Dave that took the three count this time. Stranger things have happened. Speaking of which, Number 126, Diamond Dallas Page and Canyon. Ah yes, the curious case of DDP in WWE. One of WCW's greatest success stories, DDP was thrown straight into a feud with The Undertaker and his wife Sarah. Taker grabbed little brother Kane, so DDP grabbed his former New Jersey triad buddy Chris Canyon, and we had a meaty little feud going. Feeling good about themselves, the WCW duo bested the APA for the WWE tag titles, and a SummerSlam case match against the WCW Tag Champs was set, the WCW Tag Champs being Undertaker and Kane. The massive goths absolutely dominated DDP and Canyon, and fans are still angry about it 20 years later. Number 125, Edge and Hulk Hogan. If you were to travel back in time and tell a young Adam Copeland that one day he would be WWE Tag Team Champion alongside Hulk Hogan, he would have probably exploded with glee. But it did indeed happen on Independence Day 2002, because of course the most American thing WWE could have done was give Hogan some sort of title win. It doesn't matter that Edge is Canadian. This was obviously never going to be a long-term thing, and a little under three weeks later, Hogan and Edge dropped the belts to the Un-Americans. Edge took the pin, because... Uh, of course he did. Brother! Number 124, The Holly Cousins. The Attitude Era was a hell of a time. Every title was handed about like a big game of Pass the Parcel, not just the Hardcore title. Speaking of which, the linchpins of WWE's Hardcore division, Hardcore Holly and Little Cousin Crash, picked up tag gold for a fortnight in a year that saw 15 different tag title reigns. Goodness me. Even more surprising is who the Hollies beat. The Rock and Sock Connection. Yes, the Hollies beat the Rock and Mankind in 1999. Granted, Mankind sat the match out because he felt Rock had betrayed him, he hadn't, and even then, Rock probably would have prevailed if it wasn't for interference from Triple H. Number 123, Right to Censor. The team with the undisputed greatest theme in wrestling history, Right to Censor also held gold during their brief run together, with Bull Buchanan and the Good Father holding the tag straps alongside Ivory's women's title. Now, any team who won the tag belts during WWE's golden period of tag wrestling deserves praise, but Right to Sensor's reign was very forgettable due to being overshadowed by a legendary tag division. Edge and Christian, the Hardys, the Dudleys, and so on. 34 days with the titles for the puritanical white shirt wearing boars. Number 122, Rey Mysterio and Dominic. 16 years on from winning his love in a ladder match, Rey Mysterio led son Dominic to tag glory, defeating the Dirty Dogs at WrestleMania! Backlash. And becoming the first father-son duo to hold tag gold in WWE history. The reign though was less than ideal, and the Mysterios spent the majority of it being thrown around by Universal Champion Roman Reigns. In the end, it all built up so the Usos could have yet another run with the titles. Typical. Number 121, Hurricane. The team of Shane the Hurricane Helms and Kane the Kane Kane was clearly only put together due to the puntastic name of Hurricane. That didn't matter though, as Hurricane was very fun during his run and the chalk and cheese pairing of the two worked well. The pair joined forces to take on the Un-Americans and after stereo choke slams, won the tag belts to a big pop. Okay, so the 
reign only lasted a couple of weeks until Christian and Chris Jericho beat them for the gold, but it was fun and wrestling is meant to be fun. Meant to be. Number 120. The Unholy Alliance The teaming of The Undertaker and The Big Show was inevitable from the first moment Show appeared in a WWE ring. When the two finally joined forces, it was in the wake of the corporate ministry, with a still evil Taker taking Show under his wing as the Unholy Alliance. But despite the potential of the team and the sum of its parts, the two-time tag champs only reigned for a combined 21 days. They split when a banged-up Taker took some time off so he could heal, later evolving into the American Badass. Number 119, Chris Jericho and Edge Two of the most decorated wrestlers in WWE history teamed up in 2009 and said, We're better than all these other geeks, let's just take both sets of tag titles. They went about becoming the second ever undisputed unified tag champions after beating the Colognes at the Bash. But unfortunately, Edge got injured right after the big win, rupturing his Achilles tendon. Still, it did lead to one of the best Royal Rumble returns of all time, as well as a great tag team in Jericho, but a prolonged run of Edge and Jericho could have been phenomenal. Number 118, The Headbangers Despite being in WWE for four years, the team of Mosh and Thrasher only held tag gold once, as well as the NWA tag titles during that weird NWA-WWF crossover. The skirt-wearing, circle-pit-loving skinheads won the vacant tag titles at Ground Zero in your house, defeating Owen Hart and the British Bulldog, the Godwins, and the Legion of Doom, with Mosh pinning Owen after Stone Cold ran in to cost the King of Hearts. The Headbangers lost the title to the Godwins at Bad Blood, and that was about it, really. Number 117, Kane and Mankind. To kids during the Attitude Era, there was no scarier prospect than a team of Mankind and Kane. Well, consider their pants well and truly browned when the two masked lunatics joined forces in 1998. The two were thrown together because they hated Steve Austin and The Undertaker, with all four men clashing regularly in singles and tag matches. Foley and Kane soon got the belts off the New Age Outlaws, dropped them to Austin and Taker, and then won them again. But then Kane turned his back on Mankind and The Outlaws took the belts back. 48 days between reigns for the outlaws there. Number 116, Edge and Rey Mysterio. As the brand split took flight, SmackDown needed a set of tag titles seeing as Raw had kept the OGs. Rey Mysterio and Edge entered a tournament to crown the first ever SmackDown tag champs, but were beaten in the finals by Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit, you know, two single stars who were feuding but somehow managed to win tag gold. Luckily, Rey and Edge would defeat Chris and Kurt for the straps after two weeks and would hold them for for two further weeks until dropping them to the final third of the SmackDown 6, Los Guerreros. Number 115, Chris Benoit and Chris Jericho. The two Canadian Christophers are technically part of the rivals teaming together trope, but get a pass in this list due to the matches the two were involved with as champs. They competed in the first ever non-pay-per-view TLC match when they put the gold on the line against the Dudleys, the Hardys and Edge and Christian. Often forgotten, TLC3 was an absolute corker. Oh yeah, and they beat Triple H and Steve Austin for the belts in the first place in one of the best Raw matches of all time. No biggie or anything. Number 114, Booker T and Gold Dust. Us wrestling fans love a chalk and cheese pairing and none were chalkier or cheesier than Booker T and Gold Dust. There was no way this partnership should have worked, but it did, giving Goldust a new lease of life and Booker another dimension to his character. Not even the NWO could keep them apart for long, and when they finally won the tag titles at Armageddon 2002, it was a hallelujah moment. Then, three weeks later, they lost the gold and were forced to split by Eric Bischoff. This team's legs were cut off before they could properly get going, but it was nice while it lasted. Sucker! Number 113, The Rock and Sock Connection. Despite being two of the most popular stars of the era, and despite being three-time WWE Tag Team Champions, The Rock and Sock Connection are only number 113 on this list. But why, Adam, I hear you cry? Why? 
Here's why. The legendary rock and sock connection only reigned for a combined 15 days. That is five days per reign on average, and you don't need me to tell you that that is pathetic. To be fair, the caliber of teams they faced shows you how stacked WWE was in 1999. A great tag team, yes, but terrible tag champs. Number 112, Cody Rhodes and Drew McIntyre. If this was 2021, a team of Cody Rhodes and Drew McIntyre would probably be the most winningest pair in wrestling. But alas, in 2010, they were not. McIntyre was on the downswing of his chosen one run, while Cody was dashing, and the two won the unified tag titles at Night of Champions 2010 in a five tag team turmoil match, beating legendary duo Mark Henry and Evan Bourne for the belts. 35 days later, and the Nexus team of David Otunga and John Cena defeated them for the gold, but the less said about that, the better. Number 111, the new Nexus. Wrestling lore dictates that putting new in front of a tag team dooms them before they get going. The new Rockers, the new Foundation, the new Blackjacks, the new Midnight Express, and of course, the new Nexus. Taking no one's favorite original Nexus member, David Otunga, and placing him with awkward NXT goof Michael McGillicutty didn't exactly stir up feelings of the Road Warriors, but they still reigned as tag champions for over 90 days, with one successful defense. Disappointing. Air Boom ended their reign in August 2011, and with the Nexus dead due to leader CM Punk becoming the biggest thing since the Spice Girls, Otunga and McGillicutty went their separate ways. Number 110, Spice Spike Dudley and Taz. That classic ECW pairing of Spike Dudley and Taz. I mean, this combination made almost zero sense. It's the same as going, ah, Goldberg and Chavo Guerrero were in WCW, therefore a perfect idea for a tag team. So why were they a team? Well, Spike was beefing with Bubba Ray and Devon, obviously, and brought in Taz to have his back. The four ECW alums had a hardcore match at MSG, with Spike and Taz leaving with the gold. 43 days and a few successful defenses later, Spike and Taz dropped the belts to Billy and Chuck. How extreme! Number 109, AJ Styles and Omos. You can only assume Vince McMahon woke from a full night's sleep at 3 a.m., remembered how the two dudes with attitudes got Diesel over, and Bella down the phone at Triple H, I need a big massive fella from NXT right now to be my new Kevin Nash. And so Omos was formally introduced to the WWE Universe, not counting his run as Giant Ninja or the security for Raw Underground, and became AJ Styles' muscle. The two would feud with the New Day and beat them for the straps at WrestleMania 37, then after having a pretty decent run, dropped them to RK Bro at SummerSlam. Number 108, the two-man power trip. After Steve Austin bonked to the rock on the bonce with a chair at WrestleMania X7, he went on a formidable mean streak. Now a full-blown asshole, he paired up with fellow full-blown asshole Triple H and the two-man power trip was born. The two held all the gold, with Austin's WWE title and Triple H's Intercontinental title accompanying their one and only tag title reign. But not long after they got the belts, Triple H's quads went on holiday mid-match and the team lost to Chris's Jericho and Benoit. Number 107, Rey Mysterio and Rob Van Dam. With the invasion long over, WCW and ECW talent were fully bedded into the WWE, but with a super stacked roster, Creative had literally no idea what to do with many of their stars. Management thought people like the Thumbs Man and the bloke in a mask bung them in a team, and so they did, and Rey and Rob soon won the tag titles. Not much to say on this really, both men were kicking their heels with little to do, but gave some star power to the SmackDown tag scene for a time, despite losing the belts to the Basham brothers. Number 106, The Corporation's Big Boss Man and Ken Shamrock. Late 1998 and Ken Shamrock was on a roll. The unhinged IC champion linked up with the Corporation and lifted the tag titles with the Big Boss Man, becoming a dual champion in the process. There was a quick run with the gold to get the new team over before they dropped the belts after 42 days to Jeff Jarrett and Owen Hart. Neither were that bothered really, as Shamrock's focus was on his IC title, whilst Bossman went on to do normal wrestler things like get hanged by The Undertaker, kill and cook Al Snow's dog, and assault The Big Show at a funeral. Number 105, AOP. 
It hurts me to do this. It truly does. But I have to remind myself that this was main roster AOP and not NXT's Authors of Pain. So where did it all go wrong? Well, throwing Paul Ellering in the bin was the first mistake. Getting Drake Maverick as their manager was the second. And well, the rest writes itself, really. AOP won the titles in a handicap match, beating Seth Rollins for the gold, but also lost them in a handicap match despite having the advantage, with Maverick getting pinned by Bobby Roode and Chad Gable. You know what, I think that NXT curse might be real after all. Number 104, CM Punk and Kofi Kingston. Many of these lower ranked pairings will seem like they were plucked out of thin air. A faux Jamaican and a miserable Pepsi enthusiast, it's a match made in heaven. But that aside, Kingston and Punk as a team were actually pretty good. Okay, so it was a fall from grace for Punk, who had his World Heavyweight Championship reign punted into the moon only a month before, but it gave him something to do before his IC title run. It was nice that Kofi was along for the ride too, having only debuted on Raw a few months prior. Number 103, Booker T and Rob Van Dam. 2004 was both great and garbage for Rob Van Dam. Great because he had several tag title reigns, but garbage because he had literally nothing better to do. A few months before being paired with Rey Mysterio, RVD had a quick run with Booker T on Raw, holding tag gold together for 35 days. What sets Book and Rob apart from Rey and Rob is the fact that Booker and RVD feuded with Evolution over the titles, and that they had the distinction of walking into WrestleMania 20 as tag champs and successfully defended the belts on the night. Number 102, The Brothers of Destruction. Yes, like Rock and Sock before them, The Brothers of Destruction are pretty low down this list. They did get two runs with the tag titles, but at a combined 42 days, they were hardly demolition, were they? But credit where it's due, they battled over the titles with some of the biggest names in WWE, such as Edge and Christian, the two-man power trip, and the Dudleys. An excellent team for sure, but to be honest, a team of Undertaker and Kane never really needed the titles in the first place. Number 101, Murphy and Seth Rollins. When WWE don't know what to do with their tag division, Vince McMahon whacks the big red button on his desk that says Seth Rollins and CrossFit Jesus is thrown into a team. For his sixth WWE tag title run, Rollins teamed with his disciple Murphy, taking the belts from the Viking Raiders. But while this felt like a massive step down for Rollins, it gave Murphy a platform he truly deserved. It wasn't long until the Street Profits beat the two for the belts and Rollins abandoned the tag division in favour of feuding with Kevin Owens. Number 100, The Body Donners. The Body Donners are easily one of the lamest teams in WWE history, which is crazy when you consider the sum of its parts. In Zip Tom Pritchard, you had a well-rounded journeyman with lots of tag experience, and in Skip Chris Candido, you had a fantastically underrated wrestler who never gets his due. But the package of fitness fanatics with goofy grins was always terrible, and they were consistently treated as a joke. Still, they had one reign with the tag titles, winning a tournament for the vacant straps before WrestleMania 12, until losing the gold and Sonny to the Godwins after 49 days. Number 99, Charlie Haas and Rico. Charlie Haas was a tag team specialist, and Rico was Rico. As you will already know by now, WWE loves an odd couple pairing, and this was no exception, with the straight-laced grappler and the flamboyant stylist making for a truly offbeat team. Add in Miss Jackie, and you know what? It was alright. Not tag title worthy, mind you, but they did have a 56-day run with the belts, beating Rikishi and Scotty too hotty after Rico purposefully took a stink face, then snogged Scotty. That's ring psychology right there. They went on to lose the belts to the Dudleys, not surprising since there was about a 35% chance that Bubba and Devon were in possession of doubles gold at any given time back then. Number 98, Deuce and Domino. Anachronistic Street Tough's Deuce and Domino didn't have the longest or most stellar run on WWE TV, but still managed a 133-day reign as tag team champions. On the downside, they only had three televised title defenses and only one pay-per-view appearance. There's being an afterthought and then there's whatever the hell this is. The Greasers' one pay-per-view defense was against Jimmy Snooker and Sergeant Slaughter, and there were few tears shed when Matt Hardy and MVP beat them for the gold. Well, besides Cherry who was sobbing into her vanilla coke float for weeks after. Number 97, Eddie Guerrero and Tajiri. 
Time for another team that we totally forgot happened until we put this list together. Los Guerreros were feuding with Team Angle, swapping the titles on numerous occasions. But before a rematch for the gold at Judgment Day 2003, Chavo tore his bicep and Eddie was forced to find a new partner. Tajiri stepped in and the unlikely pair won the belts in a ladder match. They lied, cheated, stole and held the belts for over 40 days, then lost them back to Haas and Benjamin. Eddie handled the loss well by throwing Tajiri through the windscreen of his lowrider. Number 96, Rikishi and Scotty 2 Hotty. After Rikishi's failed bad man heel push, the big bummed bruiser turned face again and later reunited with a returning Scotty 2 Hotty. Luckily, there was still enough fan support for the pair from their two cool days, even if the act was getting a bit stale, and they set off like nothing happened, capturing the WWE tag titles in February 2004 by defeating the Bashams. A successful defense against the APA, the Bashams and Haas and Benjamin at WrestleMania 20 was the highlight of this reign, and soon enough, Charlie Haas and Rico took the belts, with Rikishi getting his release not long after. Number 95, The B Team. Lovable losers Bo Dallas and Curtis Axel couldn't win a raffle, never mind a wrestling match, but somehow pulled off a massive upset by defeating Matt Hardy and Bray Wyatt for the tag titles at Extreme Rules 2018. How they got a title shot without many wins is beyond me, but there you go. And yes, I do know that they won a battle royal for the privilege, sorry for trying to sound surprised here. If the title win was a shock, the fact that they successfully defended against the revival is even wilder, but the B-team's luck ran out when they faced Dolph Ziggler and Drew. McIntyre. Number 94, Too Cool. One of the most surprising entries on this list is Too Cool. Not because they won the belts at all, oh no, but more for the fact that they only had one run with the straps at a measly 27 days. Even though the gimmick has dated in the last 20 odd years since their heyday, during the Attitude Era, Too Cool were absolutely massive. Their post-match dances and Scotty Too Hotty's Naughty Worm, no, not that one, made them insanely popular with the WWE audience. But timing wasn't on their side, as they had to scrap for attention against three of the greatest teams of all time. The Dudley Boys, the Hardy Boys, and Edge and Christian, the duo who eventually unseated them for the belts. Number 93, Bobby Roode and Chad Gable. Question for you, who deserved better out of this team, Rude or Gable? Rude was the miscast smiley dork who once terrorized NXT, whereas Gable was the wrestling machine who had become totally directionless. Well, it doesn't matter because they were tag champions, yay. After defeating AOP and Drake Maverick, because Maverick did a wee on Rude's robes, really, the two held the titles for over 60 days until the revival took them off their hands. If given a reason to exist and an identity, this could have been an amazing team, but alas, it was just a basket full of disappointment. Number 92, the primetime players. Millions of dollars! Millions of dollars! Before Titus O'Neil was WWE's photo op guy and after Darren Young was a John Cena meme, the two operated as the primetime players. For a bit, until they split up for a bit, and then they came back to battle the Ascension. Soon the players were in the title scene, toppling the New Day and holding the belts for a bit before dropping them back. It's a real shame that the players were hampered by such stop-start booking, as they were a half-decent tag team, really. Number 91, Billy Kidman and Paul London. When Paul London came to WWE, he teamed up with his dad, Billy Kidman, because they were both good at shooting star presses. Well, London was anyway. The two fought their way up SmackDown's tag division before a shock win over the Dudley boys got them the gold. Things were going well until Kidman botched his finisher and legitimately injured Chavo Guerrero. Unable to deal with the damage he caused, the distraught Kidman abandoned London mid-match as Kenzo Suzuki and Rene Dupree defeated them for the titles. Kidman and London eventually fused and then London re-entered the tag scene with his son, Brian Kendrick. Number 90, Eugene and William Regal. While the character of Eugene is rightfully lambasted for how shamelessly exploitative it was, the pairing of Eugene and William Regal actually made for half-decent TV. After being left in charge of Eugene by Eric Bischoff, Regal grew fond of the unique superstar, and after Eugene defeated Evil Uncle Eric at Taboo Tuesday 2004, the two pulled off an upset victory for the tag titles, defeating La Resistance on an episode of Raw. Unfortunately though, Eugene took an awkward bump off of a dropkick and was out for six months, leaving Regal 
illegal to drop the titles to La Resistance at a house show with Jonathan Coachman of all people as his emergency tag partner. Number 89, Daniel Bryan and Rowan. After losing the WWE Hempyweight title to Kofi Kingston, Daniel Bryan dusted himself off, grabbed Eric Rowan, and made a beeline for the vacant SmackDown tag titles. Their reign as champions, though, wasn't stellar, losing a non-title match against the Usos and eventually dropping the straps to the New Day at Extreme Rules 2019. What's worse, Bryan took the pin, and the match was a triple threat with heavy machinery. Seems to me like Tucker wouldn't do the job, brother. After this, the Eco Warriors went back after the titles. Oh, hang on, no they didn't. Rowan hit Roman Reigns with a car instead. Number 88, Matt Hardy and Bray Wyatt. Woken Matt Hardy and Bray Wyatt had a big bust up about who was the weirdest, which Hardy won. Wyatt disappeared into the Lake of Reincarnation, reappeared to help Hardy win the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, and the two decided they would coexist as WWE's balmiest team. The Deleters of Worlds then won the vacant Raw tag titles a few weeks later at the Greatest Royal Rumble, and didn't do a lot really. There were a few fun backstage segments, but it never really went anywhere before they dropped the belts to the B team at Extreme Rules. Number 80 Chris Benoit and Edge. Before Vince McMahon's emergency button said Seth Rollins on it, it said Edge. The Rated R Superstar is a record-setting 14-time tag team champion with six different partners. Out of all of Edge's partnerships, his team with Benoit may be the least memorable, but they still had two runs with the tag titles. And also, this was while Benoit was World Heavyweight Champion, with the Rabid Wolverine pulling double duty. The two had decent runs with the titles, exchanging them with La Resistance, but the focus was more on Benoit's singles belt, with title rival Kane helping the French boys topple the Canadians. Later on, Edge turned heel and they did the whole enemies who were forced to team gimmick, and we know how much we love that, don't we? Number 86, The Legion of Doom. Whoa now, calm down, we're not talking about Animal and Hawk yet, but unfortunately the team of Animal and Heidenreich. Yes, we all sadly remember that Heidenreich was a part of the LOD, ranking somewhere between Droz and Rocco on the list of rubbish members, but the fact this team won the tag titles and held them for three months, well... What can you say, really? Longtime fans never bought Heidenreich in the paint, whilst younger viewers probably wondered who the weird old fella with the weird hair was. The team didn't last long, and soon Heidenreich was gone from WWE. Number 85, Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase Jr. Although tag champion alongside Hardcore Holly, Cody Rhodes realized that he was spinning his wheels, so somehow defeated himself and Bob with the help of Ted DiBiase Jr. to lose slash win the titles and you thought Steiner math was confusing. Cody turning his back on Holly to form the legacy with Ted Jr. was a shrewd move and allowed both wrestlers the chance to forge their own identity, albeit identities closely tied to their more famous fathers. However, on screen they were still treated as second-class citizens, losing the belts to John Cena and Batista, winning them back, getting trounced in handicap matches against Cena, and then losing the straps to CM Punk and Kofi Kingston. Number 84, Santino Morella and Vladimir Kozlov. Love. Although best remembered for their amazing Tea Party segment with Sheamus, Santino Morella and Vladimir Kozlov also reigned as tag champions, with a 76-day reign to their name. Yes, the tag division wasn't great at the time, and the peculiar pair only won the belts because John Cena distracted champs the Nexus in a four-way match. Unfortunately, Santino and Vlad's reign played second fiddle to a Santino and Tamina romance angle, and it wasn't long until the belts were back around the waist of Justin Gabriel and Heath Slater. Number 83, Steve Austin. Austin and Dude Love. Steve Austin was tag champs with sort of rival Shawn Michaels, but Michaels briefly left WWE, vacated the belts, and Austin needed a partner to regain them. Mankind offered his assistance, but Austin snapped that olive branch in half and instead opted to take on title tournament winners Owen Hart and the British Bulldog by himself. Halfway through the match, the far more normal Dude Love debuted. The two won the vacant belts, and there was much rejoicing and bad dancing. Then, as soon as they were gaining momentum, Austin broke his neck at SummerSlam 1997, and the belts were once again vacated. Number 82, The Miz and Damian Mizdow. 
The Miz and Damian Sandow's alliance should not have been anywhere near as popular as it was, but it legit turned Mizdow into one of the most beloved superstars of his day. Their A-list douchebag and stunt double pairing was comedic gold and led to the weird concept of Miz getting booed and Mizdow getting cheered when tagging together. When they eventually won tag gold, the audience erupted, but it was fleeting and the team would split with Mizdow's push evaporating in the Andre the Giant Battle Royal. Number 81, Shinsuke Nakamura and Sus Cesaro. So instead of being main event players like they should be, Shinsuke Nakamura, Cesaro and Sami Zayn were the artist collective, feuded with Braun Strowman and looked like crap losers in the process. Sami was soon gone from TV, so Nakamura and Cesaro focused their efforts on the tag division, beating the New Day for the titles on their second attempt. Several successful defences came against Lucha House Party before New Day took the titles back and that was that really. Number 80, The Un-Americans, Christian and Lance Storm. WWE often forgets that the first W in its name stands for world and not America. And despite a large chunk of its fan base being from the USA, there are literally millions who aren't and not bothered if a team is un-American. The most annoying thing though, this was the best they could come up with for the team of Christian and Lance Storm. Regardless, wrestlers of their caliber were always bound to deliver as a team, defeating uber-Americans Hulk Hogan and Edge for the tag titles before dropping them to Hurricane 64 days later. Number 79, Christian and Chris Jericho. Not content with being un-American, Christian left the group to form a team with un-American associate Chris Jericho, recapturing the tag titles 21 days after losing them to Hurricane. This was a reign of over 60 days for the Canadians before Book Dust took the straps. The two went back to singles competition but were still affiliated. The tag title reign was the least noteworthy aspect of Christian and Jericho's partnership though, as well over a year after losing the titles, they had their breakup angle, the one that involved Trish Stratus and Christian being a creepy little bastard. Number 78, The Un-Americans, William Regal and Lance Storm. Similar to their stablemates, apparently the best that WWE could do with a team as talented as Lance Storm and William Regal was Boo America. However, the team did manage two reigns with the World Tag Team titles in 2003. The first was a blink and you'll miss it 13 day affair, but the second was a half decent 63 day reign, which only ended when Regal was put on the shelf due to a concussion and a heart parasite. You don't need me to tell you how good these two were in ring, it's just a shame their material wasn't better. Number 7 77, Primo and Epico. WWE never really knew what to do with Primo and Epico, whether it was having them be pretend bullfighters or holiday reps for Puerto Rico, nothing really stuck. Still, in their first proper run as a team, Primo and Epico reigned as WWE Tag Team Champions for over 100 days in 2012, but it was pretty lackluster. The Cousins won the titles from Air Boom at a house show, then defended against weird teams like Santino Morella and Jim Duggan, Mason Ryan and Alex Riley, Justin Gabriel and Tyson Kidd, and all also against the Usos. After Mania, it wasn't long until they dropped the gold and plummeted down the card. Number 76, The Hurricane and Rosie. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Well, obviously no, it's two wrestlers in capes, one-time tag team champions Hurricane and Rosie. The team won the titles at Backlash 2005 in a tag team turmoil match and defended them on Raw across a 140-day reign. However, the caliber of the tag division wasn't great, to say the least, with the two would-be heroes defeating the likes of Simon Dean and Maven and the Heartthrobs before Caden Murdoch beat them at Unforgiven in convincing fashion. Shortly after dropping the titles, Hurricane turned on Rosie and renamed himself Gregory. No offense to any Gregories out there, but Hurricane is a much, much better name. Number 75, Degeneration X. No, no, not good DX, but glow sticks, receding hairlines, and hornswoggle DX. Proper DX let Road Dog and Billy Gunn take care of the tag scene back in the day, but when Shawn Michaels and Triple H reformed in 2006, they decided it was their turn with the straps, defeating Jericho for the unified tag team titles in a chaotic TLC match at TLC 2009. DX's feud with Jericho was decent and saw Mike Tyson rejoin the group, but the shtick was as old and tired as Shawn Michaels' chaps, and when they finally dropped the belts to show Miz after 57 days, we were all secretly a little bit glad about it. Number 74, Dolph Ziggler and Drew McIntyre. 
It's hard to know what to think about Ziggler and McIntyre as a team. On one hand, it was a solid pairing of two great workers, but on the other, it was a shameless attempt to recapture the two dudes with attitude vibe. Granted, Drew didn't need this, whilst Dolph definitely did, but it was nice to see them poised as a threat, with the two, and sometimes Braun Strowman, being a massive pain in the bum of the reformed Shield. But the Shield were too much for them to handle, with Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose taking the titles after 49 days. Number 73, Kenzo Suzuki and Rene Dupree. Ah, an arrogant Frenchman with a poodle and a karaoke-loving Japanese bloke, a tale as old as time. The short-lived team of Kenzo Suzuki and Rene Dupree were arguably more known for Suzuki's pro-America gimmick of badly singing famous songs rather than any actual matches, but they still reigned as tag champions on SmackDown for over 90 days in 2004. As champs, the two routinely clashed with Rob Van Dam and Rey Mysterio, successfully defending the gold against the two at no mercy before finally relinquishing the titles on an episode of SmackDown. Suzuki and Dupree soon parted ways, with Suzuki ending up in a feud with John Cena, whilst Rene was sacrificed by The Undertaker. Nothing weird about all that, then. Number 72, The Basham Brothers. Literal gimps Doug and Danny Basham were the playthings of dominatrix Shaniqua because it was the early 2000s, and this was how WWE rolled. The pair reigned as tag champs on two occasions, but never set the world on fire because, you know, bald gimps. Their first reign did see them defeat Los Guerreros for the titles and win several rematches, but the whole affair was more about Eddie and Chavo not getting on rather than the athletic prowess of the Bashams. After ditching the leather and whips, the Bashams joined JBL's cabinet, beat RVD and Mysterio for the belts, were treated like chumps week in and week out, then dropped the straps to Mysterio and Eddie a few weeks later. Number 71, Kane and Rob Van Dam. As two of the most overstars of the time, the teaming of Kane and RVD did did nothing to halt either man's popularity, with both men viable contenders to end Triple H's reign of terror whilst also competing in the tag division. Sure enough, the two captured tag gold after defeating the Dudleys and champs Lance Storm and Chief Morley, and defended the belts across several major shows. But alas, it was Triple H that ruined everything. Not long after Kane and Van Damme lost the titles to La Resistance, Kane also lost his mask to Triple H, and an enraged big red machine chokeslammed RVD whilst covered in mucky muck. Number 70, Jeff Jarrett and Owen Hart. With the Nation of Domination dissolved, Owen Hart had nothing to do. Double J was also up to bugger all, and the two teamed up. But just when things seemed straightforward, the Blue Blazer gimmick showed up to cause havoc. Everyone knew the Blazer was Owen until it turned out to be Jarrett's and then Coco Beware, and amongst all the confusion, Owen and Jeff defeated Big Boss Man and Ken Shamrock to win the tag titles. A successful defense at WrestleMania 15 was the in-ring highlights before Kane and X-Pac ended their reign. In fairness, this was a lot of fun. The Rocket and the Chosen One complemented each other very well. Number 69, <laughs> William Regal and Tajiri. William Regal is arguably the king of the odd couple partnership in WWE. We've already talked about his partnership with Eugene, but it was Regal's run with Tajiri that was his crowning glory. The two were initially paired when Regal was WWE commissioner, but parted ways during the invasion. Several years later, WWE were hosting Raw from Japan for the very first time, so the band got back together to defeat La Resistance for the tag straps to a huge reaction. The two defended against the likes of La Resistance and the Heart Throbs before losing the titles in a tag team turmoil match at Backlash 2005. Number 68, Hardcore Holly and Cody Rhodes. I imagine the conversation went something like this. Vince, we've got Dusty's boy here and we want to get him over. Who, Dustin? No, Cody. Put him with Bob Holly. Kids love Bob Holly, pal. Give them the tag titles too and let them figure it out. Okay, I'm no good at Vince McMahon impressions. But that's how Holly and Rhodes reigned as tag champs for over 200 days. Now, no disrespect to Bob Core Hardplug, but in 2007, nobody cared. And Cody was a whiter than white meat babyface, and not even the grandson of a plumber could make the fans care. Still, the two were a sound team, first feuding over a matter of respect before joining joining up and eventually beating Cade and Murdoch for the titles. However, they didn't manage any pay-per-view defenses in 200 days until they lost the belts at Night of Champions to Ted DiBiase and... Cody Rhodes. To be fair though, Cody's turn kinda made it all worth it, sort of. Number 67, Kane and X-Pac. 
With DX going by the wayside, X-Pac befriended Kane, the loneliest boy in all the land, gifting him the power of speech and sharing shampooing tips for their lovely curly manes. They also won the tag titles twice and Kane got a girlfriend too! Everything was coming up Millhouse for the Big Red Machine. And wouldn't you know it, DX got back together. Would the Big Red Machine become the Big Green Machine? Well, no. X-Pac betrayed Kane, stole his girlfriend and shot him in the face with a flame thrower. Par for the course, really. Number 66, Kofi Kingston and R-Truth. Another pair of superstars with nothing to do, Kofi and Truth were teamed for no reason of any real substance. And away they went, toppling tag champs Primo and Epico on an episode of Raw in 2012. Despite this run being a fairly filler time for both men, it was surprisingly good, with the always popular Kofi and Truth regularly defending the straps on TV and pay-per-view. Successful defenses came against the likes of Dolph Ziggler and Jack Swagger and the primetime players, but dysfunctional frenemies Team Hell No ended ended their run at 139 days, and the team split the same week. Number 65, Montel Vontavious Porter and Matt Hardy. Okay, yes, this is another case of rivals tagging together, but this one worked well, made sense, and didn't dominate TV, so I'm allowing it, okay? MVP was US champion and was feuding with Matt Hardy over the gold, with the two engaging in a game of one-upsmanship to prove who was the best. MVP declared that he was that good that he could win the tag titles with anybody, so Teddy Long holla hollered, teamed MVP with Matt, and the two defeated Deuce and Domino for the belts. For a while, the two got along Famously, but after they lost the titles, they resumed punching each other in the face for the US title like a pair of rock'em sock'em robots. Number 64, The Hurt Business. Ah, The Hurt Business were great, weren't they? For a spell, the group held all the gold and it looked like there was a potential dynasty about to take flight. I mean, Shelton Benjamin and Cedric Alexander only beat the bloody New Day for the tag titles in the first place. You don't start life as a team better than that. However, modern WWE doesn't really care about the tag titles unless they're in the possession of the New Day or the Usos, and as such, Cedric and Shelton basically held the straps in the background of Lashley promo and looked cool. They dropped them back to the New Day after an 85-day reign. Then, before they had an opportunity to reclaim what was rightfully theirs, WWE plucked Shelton and Cedric from the Hurt Business, then split them up for no good reason at all. Second time's a charm, eh, lads? Number 63, Heath Slater and Justin Gabriel. Whether causing chaos as the Nexus or doing whatever it is they did in the core, Heath Slater and Justin Gabriel could always be relied upon to put on a decent match in the tag division. Unfortunately for the team though, the stink of the Nexus's botched booking would not wash off and their title runs were far less illustrious than they should have been. They began their first reign in a sham, lost them to Santino Morella and Vladimir Kozlov, won them back two months later, lost them after a day to the two rivals tagging together, won them back later the same night, then lost them to Kane and Big Show after another couple of months. So yeah, not a great run for Heath and Justin, and they should have been treated better. Like the rest of the Nexus, really. Number 62, Tyson Kidd and Cesaro. Unlike other times when separate tag specialists with nothing to do have been paired up, the team of Cesaro and Tyson Kidd worked fantastically well. Two in-ring technicians who deserved better from WWE, the self-dubbed Brass Ring Club wasted no time in tearing through WWE's tag division, winning the titles from the Usos a month after officially forming. Kidd and Cesaro successfully defended the straps at WrestleMania 31 before losing them to the New Day at Extreme Rules, with New Day turning heel and Kidd and Cesaro becoming face in the the process. Unfortunately, Kid suffered a career-ending injury later in 2015, and had he not, you can assume the masters of the WWE Universe would have had multiple reigns with the titles. Number 61, The Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov. 80s WWE was primarily built on one key premise, USA is number one. With this in mind, there were arguably no bigger heels in the company than the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov. Sheik had been toppled for the WWE title by Hulk Hogan in 1984, but Vince McMahon saw the value in Sheiky Baby, paired him with Russian Nikolai Volkov and stuck the two in the tag division, winning the tag titles from the US Express at WrestleMania 1. The two only held the gold for 78 days before dropping them back to the US Express, but the heat they generated as champs put the Express over even bigger when they won the titles back. Number 60, The Spirit Squad. 
Kenny, Nikki, the other three. Yes, we all remember the Spirit Squad, those annoying green twerps full of spirit. But when we think of the squad, we likely think of their unceremonious end rather than their lengthy 216 day reign as tag team champions. Adopting the Freebird rule, but mainly consisting of Kenny and Mikey, the Spirit Squad beat Kane and Big Show for the titles and defeated a who's who of tag teams, Jim Duggan and Eugene, Charlie Haas and Viscera, Snitsky and Val Venus, and the Highlanders. Golden days, weren't they? They were routinely buried in handicap matches against the aging degenerates. Soon they lost the titles to Ric Flair and Roddy Piper and were literally sealed in a box and shipped back to OVW. Number 59, The Dirty Dogs. While you could look at the team of Ziggler and Rude and go, well, they clearly were put together because WWE has nothing better for them, you would be doing the Dirty Dogs a disservice. Two of the finest workers in all of WWE and in Rude, one of the best heels in the business, the Dirty Dogs' legitimacy as solo stars helped the team take flight when they just sort of ended up teaming together in 2019. The two won the Raw tag titles after roughly a fortnight as a team, defeating warring rivals Seth Rollins and Braun Strowman for the straps, held them for a month, and then buggered off to SmackDown. On SmackDown, they won the titles from the Street Profits and reigned for an impressive 129 days, but did little of note until dropping the straps to Rey and Dominic Mysterio at WrestleMania Backlash. Number 58, Heath Slater and Rhino. One criticism of modern WWE is that they don't often pull the trigger on an angle or superstar when they should, something which cannot be said about the team of Heath Slater and Rhino. Fresh off of Slater being undrafted, the audience rallied behind the one-man band with We Want Slater chants ringing out at pay-per-views and episodes of SmackDown. Former ECW champion Rhino routinely beat up Slater, then took pity on the downtrodden fool, and the two formed a kinship based on spray cheese and above-ground swimming pools, obviously. With the brand split fresh, SmackDown created its own set of tag titles as Slater and Rhino beat the Usos to become inaugural champions. The pair were likeable and over and reigned as champs for more than 80 days, until Bray Wyatt and Randy Orton in a sleeveless hoodie ended their run. Number 57, The Colognes. When you think about it, cologne sounds a bit like colon, doesn't it? No? Well, try telling that to WWE, who laughed themselves hoarse when they realized. Despite being the literal butt of Miz and Morrison's jokes, Carlito and Primo managed to become the first ever unified WWE tag champions, holding both sets of titles aloft at WrestleMania 25 on the pre-show. Unfortunately, this perfectly sums up the Colognes run as champs. An afterthought in a dwindling division, and let's be honest, Miz and Morrison should have won the unified straps anyway, the Colognes bumbled on as dual champs, beating the likes of Haas and Benjamin and Jamie Noble and Chavo Guerrero until they were unceremoniously defeated by Edge and Chris Jericho. What's bizarre is that they reigned for over 280 days with the SmackDown belts and over 80 as unified champs. Yet the first thing we think of is Miz and Morrison in arse masks. Number 56, La Resistance, Rene Dupree and Sylvain Grognier. A few shades less impressive than the namesake song from the South Park film, La Resistance saw WWE go back to the boo us because we hate America well. The first duo to use the La Resistance name consisted of Sylvain Grognier and rookie sensation Rene Dupree. And after winning the tag titles from Kane and Rob Van Dam at Bad Blood 2003, the 19-year-old Dupree was instated as the youngest champion in WWE history, a record which stood until Nicholas toddled along and pissed all over it. Far from being domineering champion, La Resistance were more a bunch of arrogant wimps because stereotypes. With new member Robert Conway joining the fray, the trio picked a fight with those uber-American patriots, the, um, Dudley boys, before losing the titles to them in a handicap tables match at Unforgiven 2003. Number 55, La Resistance, Robert Conway and Sylvain Grognier. After Rene Dupree packed his bags and sauntered off to SmackDown, Rob Conway and Sylvain Grognier carried on flying the La Resistance flag. Smarmy, snivelling heels, the two somehow managed to receive a monstrous ovation when they defeated Chris Benoit and Edge for the tag titles. Oh, hang on, they won them in Quebec. Yeah, that makes sense. As champs, Grognier and Conway curried favour with Raw GM Eric Bischoff, who helped keep the gold around their waists for over five months until they lost them back to Benoit and Edge, despite Edge buggering off partway through the match. It's almost like WWE values singles main eventers instead of the tag champs. Two more reigns followed, but they were pretty forgetful and mainly involved La Resistance getting worked over by William Regal and his wacky partner of the week. Number 54, Soul Patrol. 
Soul Patrol, Rocky Johnson and Tony Atlas hold two distinct honors in WWE. They were the first new tag team champions as WWE withdrew from the NWA, and they were the first black wrestlers in history to hold the tag championships when they defeated the Wild Samoans in November 1983. Johnson and Atlas faced a tough road to the gold, falling foul to the Samoans cheating time and time again, but got the win in a no DQ match when Captain Lou Albano accidentally nailed Affa with a wooden chair. Soul Patrol ran with the title for 154 days before losing to the North-South Connection, which is remarkable in itself as Johnson and Atlas reportedly hated one another. Alas, their run as a team was brief, but bloody hell, they got a lot done in a short amount of time. Number 53, The Brain Busters. The Four Horsemen's Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard jumped ship from the NWA to WWE in 1988 and went straight to work dismantling the tag division one body part at a time. With Bobby Heenan in their corner, they became a nigh-on unstoppable force, making their way through the Hart Foundation, the Rockers, and Strike Force before facing off with record-breaking tag champs Demolition. With a little help from Heenan and Andre the Giant, the Busters ended Axe and Smash's reign at 478 days, becoming the first ever team to hold both NWA and WWE tag gold. Unfortunately, Arn and Tully weren't long for WWE, and after 76 days dropped the titles back to Demolition in controversial fashion. The two were due to head back to WCW, but Arn went back on his own as a failed drugs test for Tully ended their new partnership for good. Really, Tully? Drugs? Use your brain, buster. <laughs> Number 52, The Acolytes. Despite Hall of Fame-worthy careers for JBL and Farouk, as a team, the Acolytes' greatest exploits were away from the tag scene, running the APA. That being said, whenever the two barroom brawlers wanted a slice of tag gold, they usually got it, reigning as WWE tag champs on three separate occasions. Yet for a team as dominant and as feared as the APA, their total time as champions clocks in at a measly 79 days across all reigns. That's the Attitude Era for you, I suppose. Belts changed hands more times than a child. Pokemon card in 1999. But when you factor in the APA's feuds with the likes of Kane and X-Pac, the Hardys, the Dudleys, and DDP and Canyon, it was a seriously stacked time for the tag scene. Plus, you know, the Acolytes could legitimately destroy anyone in the Fed, which has to count for something. Number 51, American Alpha. The second coming of Team Angle, it's safe to say we had high hopes for American Alpha when they made the leap from NXT to SmackDown. They were positioned fairly well, racking up wins left, right, and center. After a spell of falling short at the last hurdle, they overcame Randy Orton and Luke Harper, Heath Slater and Rhino, and the Usos to become SmackDown tag champs, becoming the first team to hold the NXT titles and main roster tag titles in the same year. Gable and Jordan would overcome practically the entire SmackDown tag division at Elimination Chamber, but just could not shake the Usos, who relieved them of the straps after 84 days. And then, before they could really sink their teeth back into the division, WWE split American Alpha in the draft and decided that Jason Jordan was Kurt Angle's son. Number 50, Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins. Oh, that Seth Rollins is a naughty boy, breaking up the shield and shattering Dean Ambrose's sweaty little heart. Luckily, time heals all wounds, and after a couple of years and a couple of unreciprocated fist bumps, the two rode again, instantly toppling the bar for the tag titles at SummerSlam 2017. As two of the most popular stars in WWE, their run as champions made people give a damn about the tag titles again, and a full reformation of the shield and your dad Kurt Angle had found and clamoring for more. After a couple of months, the tandem dropped the belts back to the bar, but would have another shot at the straps a year later, defeating Drew McIntyre and Dolph Ziggler for run number two. However, this time Ambrose turned his back on Rollins, decided he was a germaphobe, and started dreaming about a life in Jacksonville. Number 49, Caden Murdoch. Lance Cade and Trevor Murdoch were in the right place at the wrong time. Ten years earlier, they could have been a force in the latter days of the new generation. Ten years later, they could have been a solid unit in NXT. Still, the Southern Bruisers made the most of their time together, reigning as tag champs on three separate occasions. Their first run in 2005 was pretty forgettable, and their latter runs in 2007 only slightly better. Caden Murdoch's second and best reign kicked off in controversial fashion after beating the Hardys on Raw, with the two men then battling such teams as 
as The Highlanders and Crime Time, but usually at house shows. They dropped the titles to London and Kendrick for three untelevised days, then soldiered on like nothing had happened. Unfortunately, whilst champions, the two were beaten in a couple of televised handicap matches, once against Triple H and once with Umaga against John Cena and Candice Michelle. Number 48, The Hart Dynasty. An unfortunate theme of Tyson Kidd's in-ring career was things ending before they really got started, and in kayfabe, the biggest of these was his run with D.H. Smith and Natalia as the Hart Dynasty. A modern-day take on both the Hart Foundation and the British Bulldogs, Kidd and Smith were only a team on the main roster for a little over a year, but reigned as the final unified tag champions before the classic titles were scrapped. Defeating champion Show Miz in April 2010, Smith and Kidd barely got an opportunity to defend the belts on TV, defeating The Miz and Chris Jericho at Over the Limit, The Usos at Money in the Bank, and that was about it. It's almost as if Vince McMahon isn't bothered about the tag team titles, and when the Hart Dynasty dropped them to Cody Rhodes and Drew McIntyre after 146 days, many people didn't even realise that they were still champions. Number 47, Hawkins and Ryder. Action figure aficionado Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins had several gimmicks before they struck gold, literally and figuratively, as the Edgeheads. The Rated R Superstars private fan club enjoyed the success that hanging with the world champion brought, winning the tag titles at the Great American Bash 2008 and becoming the youngest tag champs in WWE history. However, their reign was poor, and despite holding the straps for over 60 days, they lost them on their first televised defense. Zack and Kurt's second run in 2019 was far better though, when against all odds, the reunited duo topped the revival to a massive pop during WrestleMania 35's pre-show, ending lovable loser Kurt's 269 match losing streak. The revival just wouldn't leave the two alone though, regaining the belts after 64 days. Both runs were typical of the pair's time in WWE. Give them a bit of momentum, pull the rug out from underneath, then do sod all with them for months on end. Number 46? The Natural Disasters Earthquake and Typhoon Two hulking bruisers you would not want to mess with, nor would you want to cut in front of at a buffet. After terrorizing WWE and routinely butting heads with the Legion of Doom, the Disasters had a change of heart after manager Jimmy left them for Money Inc. and started beating up Ted DiBiase and IRS instead. After several false dawns, the Disasters toppled Money Inc. for the gold at a TV taping, beat the Beverly Brothers on several occasions, then resumed their feud with Money Inc. This culminated in Quake and Typhoon dropping the titles back to the rich fellas on an episode of Wrestling Challenge. For a team so fondly remembered, it's a little strange that their run without the titles was better than their run with the titles, but that's wrestling, I suppose. Number 45, Two Dudes With Attitudes. With Shawn Michaels and Diesels making their way up the card, HBK convinced Vince McMahon that he and Big Daddy Cool just absolutely needed the tag titles, defeating the Head Shrinkers at a house show in 1994 while Diesel was also IC champion. The two were booked super strongly, obviously, but after Shawn accidentally super kicked Diesel, the wheels fell off and the two vacated the titles. But don't lose your smile, because they eventually made up after fighting over the WWE title, and the affections of Pamela Anderson and Jenny McCarthy, core blimey, and decided they were better as a unit. And they were, with WWE Champion Diesel and IC Champion Shawn defeating tag champs Owen Hart and Yokozuna for the straps in 1995. Okay, so this second reign was over before it began due to a technicality, and the fact that Michaels rarely jobbed in the 90s. But just look at the two holding all the gold. Impressive, isn't it? Those big, sexy decorations. Boys. Number 44, Show Miz. How many of you remember the fact that Napoleon Dynamite was the reason Big Show and Miz officially teamed together? After a couple of weeks as a force, Show Miz lifted the unified tag team titles after defeating CM Punk and Kofi Kingston and defending champions DX in a triple threat match. The two were a great unit, with Miz often pulling double duty as tag champ and US champ, while Big Angry Paul usually leveled whoever stepped up to them. As a team, they reigned for 77 days, defeating the likes 
likes of Mark Henry and MVP, and a successful defense against John Morrison and R-Truth at WrestleMania 26 before losing the straps to the Hart Dynasty in April 2010. Big Show handled the loss well by punching Miz in his totally punchable face, then turned babyface because of course he bloody did. Number 43, Rated RKO. Even though they didn't reign all that long as tag champions, the team of Randy Orton and Edge helped elevate the Raw Tag Team titles after a period of relative dormancy. It helped that both men were young, ruthless, and former world champions, albeit with little to do. The belts helped keep the pair fresh and allowed them to be scummy, violent heels, laying out whoever got in their way with spears, RKO's, and a couple of chairs for good measure. The tandem got the titles from Ric Flair and Roddy Piper after concertoing Hot Rod and right him out of the match and made damn well sure they were thorns in every major babyface's side from then on. Unfortunately, two of those babyfaces were Shawn Michaels and John Cena, and because they were set to face each other for the WWE title at WrestleMania, they just had to reign as tag champs as well. Number 42, Gallows and Anderson. When WWE scooped up Gallows and Anderson from New Japan, it was assumed that either A, Bullet Club were coming to WWE, or B, the tag division was about to get a massive kick up the Festus. In the end, neither actually happened, and what should have been a return to the glory days of tag wrestling became yet another false dawn. Still, Gallows and Anderson were prominently placed on WWE TV, pretending pickled eggs in jars were testicles, and, well, that's about it, really. They did manage two runs with the Raw tag titles, though. The first lasted 64 days and was ended by the returning Hardy Boys at WrestleMania 33, whilst the second lasted just three weeks and was ended by Seth Rollins and Braun Strowman. Roman. Hardly the resume of a division-changing team, but they're good brothers, so we'll let them off. Number 41, the Steiner Brothers. If this list was the best tag teams in wrestling history, then the Steiner Brothers would be battling for the top spots. However, Rick and Scott's quick WWE run in the early 90s was merely a footnote in their storied career, despite having two runs as tag champs. Well, I say two runs, one run lasted two whole days after defeating and then losing to Money Inc. But thankfully, for the safety of everyone involved, they won the titles back three days later. Crisis averted. The Steiners put on great title defenses, as you would imagine, but failed to set the world on fire like they would in WCW and in Japan. Alas, after a few successful defenses on Raw and one at SummerSlam, that was your lot, with the Quebecers winning the titles by DQ in September 1993. Number 40, The Viking Raiders. The first team in wrestling history to win tag gold in Ring of Honor, New Japan, NXT, and WWE. It's a shame that the Viking Raiders aren't higher on this list. A dominant force on the black and gold brand, it took only a few months on Raw before the Raiders held gold, defeating the Dirty Dogs. Again, we all hoped this would kick off a new era of tag excellence in WWE, and whilst the teams in the division were all fantastic, WWE weren't really that bothered about showing them off. Okay, so the Vikings got a victory over the Undisputed Era and the New Day at Survivor Series 2019, but this was just for bragging rights, which we all know means absolutely nothing to anyone outside of WWE Creative. Seth Rollins and Disciple Buddy Murphy then decided they wanted a slice of the action and beat the Norse Nutters for the straps, and since then they have yet to reclaim them. Number 39, Evolution. Like with Michaels and Diesel, Evolution holding the tag belts allowed Batista to sit under the learning tree of Ric Flair, whilst allowing Evolution to hold all of the gold too, of course. Though the sight of Flair and Big Dave together may have looked a little jarring, the psychology in pairing the Wily Veteran and the Furious Powerhouse is a tried and true tag team formula. As champions and as best buddies of Triple H, Flair and Batista were featured performers on Raw and successfully defended the titles against the likes of the Dudley Boys, Shawn Michaels and Chris Benoit, and Chris Jericho and Christian, amongst others, across their two reigns. But more often than not, the focus was on Trips and his big gold belt. And even though it was nice to have featured tag team champions, they spent far too much time protecting Hunter's title rather than their own. Number 38, Air Boom. Is there a worse name for a team than Air Boom? Yes, kids, the high-flying team of Evan Bourne and Kofi Kingston originally could have been called the Attitude Era, but instead were named after a trouser trumpet that could potentially break the sound barrier. 
But hey, the two were likeable and very popular and were in a unique spot to potentially make WWE tag wrestling relevant again, starting that quest by defeating David Otunga and Michael McGillicutty in August 2011. Bum Blast were well positioned on TV and had several defenses on pay-per-view against the likes of R-Truth and The Miz and Dolph Ziggler and Jack Swagger. Unfortunately, Bourne was soon suspended for 30 days, but the teams kept the titles, successfully defending against Primo and Epico at TLC 20. 2011. But a few weeks later, they dropped the titles at a house show to Primo and Epico after Bourne picked up his second wellness policy suspension, ending the team there and then. Number 37, The Colossal Connection. It's strange to think that aside from his 22nd long reign as WWE Champion, the only title Andre held in the Fed was the tag titles with Haku as the Colossal Connection. Granted, the tag titles were mainly put on the two, so an increasingly immobile Andre could be a featured attraction whilst Haku did all the work, but it was another feather in the cap of a WWE who was still boasting the most impressive roster on the planet, and a quick fix for the tag teamless Heenan family after the Brain Busters went back to the NWA. The Connection ended Demolition's second reign with the Strats and asserted their dominance over the tag division with wins against the likes of the Rockers and the Hart Foundation. Come WrestleMania 6 and Demolition took the titles back. Haku and Heenan turned on Andre, Andre beat the bollocks off the pair of them and rode into the sunset on the WrestleMania 3 ring cards. Number 36, Billy and Chuck. You look so good to me. The WWE's original ambiguously gay duo were hardly subtle and were at times borderline offensive, but the unit of Billy Gunn and Chuck Palumbo made for a damn good team. Two-time tag champions, Billy and Chuck gave the division a boot up the backside, defeating Spike Dudley and Taz for the gold and beating the likes of the Hardys and the APA as champs. After a weird fortnight where their stylist Rico beat them for the titles with Rikishi, the two regained the belts for another short run before losing to the ridiculously overpowered team of Hulk Hogan and Edge. Curiously, Billy and Chuck were the last ever WWF Tag Team Champions and the first ever WWE Tag Team Champions, as their reign occurred during the Get The F Out campaign. Their title reigns are often overshadowed by their cancelled commitment ceremony, but they were a truly dominating tag force for the best part of a year. Number 35, The Head Shrinkers. Despite the gimmick being woefully dated even in the now ancient 90s, the team of Samu and not Rikishi yet Fatu overcame the limitations of their gimmick to become a cornerstone of the new gen's tag scene. After a middling run as brutal heels, it was when the pair turned face that their fortunes changed, defeating the Quebecers for the title in 1994. They successfully defended against the likes of Yokozuna and Crush, the Quebecers, and various jobber teams like the Executioners. Unfortunately for the Head Shrinkers, when gearing up for a tag title defense against the Million Dollar Corporation at SummerSlam 94, house show opponents Shawn Michaels and Diesel legitimately decided that they were having the belts, brother, and beat them the night before the pay-per-view. The click strikes again. Samu left WWE to rehab injuries, Sione took his place, and things slowly fell apart like a cake in a bath. Not that I've ever eaten a whole cake in a bath before, besides that one time. Number 34, The US Express. As we've already discovered, WWE during its 80s boom was super pro-American. Needing a super pro-American team to join its ranks, Vince McMahon signed the US Express, Barry Windham and Mike Rotunda. The two were thrust to the top of the tag division, coming out to Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA and high-fiving all the keen kids on the front row. It wasn't long until they were installed as tag champs, defeating the North-South Connection in January 1985 after just three months in the company. The Express briefly dropped the titles to Sheiky Baby and Nikolai Volkov at WrestleMania 1, regained them a few months later, and then dropped them once again to the Dream Team. And that was it. Wyndham headed back to the NWA, and Rotunda followed shortly after. Considering WWE commissioned Real American to be their theme song, you can assume that there was more championship gold coming their way had they stayed. Number 33, The North-South Connection. 
Adrian Adonis was at an impasse when his East-West Connection team had to end due to Jesse Ventura retiring from in-ring competition. Luckily, Dick Murdoch was doing nothing and the two formed the North-South Connection instead. Man, geography is easy, isn't it? The uncompromising Murdoch and Adonis were only together for a handful of months before defeating tag champ Soul Patrol. They started a 279-day run with the gold, beating the likes of the Wild Samoans, Salvatore Below and Tony Gurria, and even the Briscoe Brothers. This was still the house show era of wrestling, so various teams including the likes of Bob Backlund, Mil Mascaras, Tito Santana, and Jimmy Snooker took on the connection in losing efforts, whilst Adonis and Murdoch even wrestled a bunch of matches in New Japan during this time. Eventually, all good things must come to an end, and after losing the belts to the US Express in January 1985, the North-South connection soon parted ways. Number 32, Jericho. All the way back at entry number 119, we said how Chris Jericho and Edge's tag title run was hampered before it even began due to another Edge injury. Rather than sulk, Jericho called up old WCW mate Big Show, and the two reigned as Jericho. Smarmy yet miserable, the pair were featured players on WWE TV week in, week out, with Jericho and Show's main event shine rubbing off on the titles as a result. Jericho was the first time in a long time that tag champs were treated as a truly big deal, wrestling across Raw and SmackDown, beating pretty much everyone in their way, and getting a ton of heat as they did it. They beat Legacy, Crime Time, Mark Henry and MVP, and Batista and Rey Mysterio before finally facing off with DX. Oh, and through it all, both men were also involved in the world title scene, stacked. Number 31, The Bludgeon Brothers. Curious, isn't it, how in all their time tagging in WWE, Eric Rowan and the late great Luke Harper didn't get a sniff of the tag titles before adopting the utterly bonkers Bludgeon Brothers gimmick. Okay, so the idea of gargantuan hairy fellas with creepy masks and giant mallets is kinda cool if you're a fresh team, or I don't know, six years old, but we already knew and loved the two from their Wyatt family days. Regardless, the brothers were pushed very strongly, making mincemeat of the Usos and the New Day for the titles at WrestleMania 34 and reigning as undefeated, nigh unstoppable badasses. The Usos? Hammered. Team Hell No? Bludgeoned. Gallows and Anderson? Brothered. The Bludgeon Brothers' 135-day reign eventually came to an end at the hands of the New Day, and injuries to the two meant that this was their last full run as a team. Number 30, Kane and the Big Show. Whilst watching this video, two things will have been made abundantly clear. Vince McMahon likes humongous men, and Vince McMahon prefers main eventers to tag teams. Realizing he couldn't completely do away with the concept of tag wrestling, Vince paired together former world champion Kane and the Big Show, and the two monsters had a fragile alliance for the best part of two decades. After a quick run in 2001, the two reformed at Taboo Tuesday 2005 with nothing better to do, and beat Cade and Murdoch for the tag titles. Being legit main eventers, the team were positioned well and had a dominant run of 153 days before Green Goof's The Spirit Squad took the titles off their hands. A second runner's champ came six years later during a feud with The Core and the new Nexus with a quick 34-day reign punctuated by Alberto Del Rio hitting Big Show with a car. Number 29, The Dust Brothers. For all the flack the authority angle got, it made us give a damn about Cody Rhodes and Goldust in a big way. After being fired and belittled, they fought their way back into WWE and took the straps off of the formidable Shield. With Dad Dusty cheering them on, the brothers beat everyone from the Shield through the Usos, Rybaxel, and the Real Americans. Cracks started to appear, but the Rhodes soldiered on until dropping the belts to the New Age Outlaws. Cody told Goldust to find a new partner, seeing himself as the weak link. Ooh, we all cooed. Cody versus Dustin, yeah? Well, no. Cody became Stardust, and the two had a second reign with the straps, defeating the Usos at Night of Champions. To be fair, Cody gave his all to the Stardust gimmick, but you just couldn't help but feel disappointed by how WWE squandered this whole angle. Number 28, The Shield. 
To say The Shield was a breath of fresh air was an understatement. To say they were the greatest thing since Super Noodles would be an overstatement. Let's go somewhere in the middle, shall we? The Shield were a much needed boost to WWE's main roster, with three future main eventers causing utter chaos everywhere they went. To carry on their early momentum, Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins picked up the tag belts from Team Hell No at Extreme Rules 2013, a show that also saw Dean Ambrose beat US champion Kofi Kingston. Rollins and Reigns were dominant champions, defeating Daniel Bryan and Randy Orton, the Usos, and the primetime players on pay-per-view, whilst also serving as Triple H's personal attack dogs. By the time The Shield lost their titles to a fired-up Rhodes Brothers, they were made men. This is how you establish a new act, and this is how you put the tag champs on the same level as the headliners. Number 27, Los Guerreros. In WCW, Eddie Guerrero wasn't particularly nice to nephew Chavo, but by the time they were both in WWE, they had patched up their differences and united as Los Guerreros. Part of the heralded SmackDown 6, the team were the third ever SmackDown tag champs, defeating Chris Benoit and Kurt Angle, and champions Edge and Rey Mysterio for the belts at Survivor Series 2002. Initially sly heels, Eddie and Chavo turned face because, come on now, you couldn't help but love them. The bulk of Eddie and Chavo's time as a team came battling the rookie sensations Team Angle, with the two teams exchanging the belts throughout 2003, including a brief run where an injured Chavo was replaced by Tajiri. Eventually, the cracks started to show, and shortly after losing the titles to the Bashams, Eddie and Chavo started to feud amongst themselves. Number 26, Paul London and Brian Kendrick. Remember London and Kidman? Well, they're back in spanky form, with Brian Kendrick proving a far better partner to Paul London than the BK Bomber ever was. Whereas Kidman and London were positioned as master and apprentice, London and Kendrick were equals, and their energy and explosiveness saw them quickly adapt as a team, defeating Eminem for the tag titles at Judgment Day 2006. The Hooligans then reigned for a mammoth 334 days, a record that stood for over a decade. In this time, they defeated the Hardys, Eminem, William Regal and Dave Taylor, including that ladder match, and with Ashley Mazzaro in their corner, they became one of the most popular acts on SmackDown. Eventually, the tandem lost the belts to Deuce and Domino in Italy, shuffled over to Raw, then had a three-day reign as Raw tag champs after defeating Cade and Murdoch at a house show. Number 25, Strike Force. Is there a more 80s tag team name than Strike Force? So called because the team of Rick Martel and Tito Santana liked to strike with force. They also came out to the equally 80s Girls in Cars theme. This had nothing to do with striking with force, but it was still pretty neat. Strike Force were wildly popular babyfaces, and after fighting through the ranks, they won the titles by beating the Hart Foundation in October 1987. Santana and Martel successfully defended against the Islanders, Los Conquistadors, the Bolsheviks, the Hart Foundation, and more, but their luck would run out at WrestleMania 4 when they faced the terrifying demolition. Although Strike Force battled valiantly, they were ultimately swept aside. They were down, but not out though, and they went back for a rematch, only for Martel to get demolition decapitated on the floor and written off for five months. Woof. Number 24, The Revival. Say yeah! The first WWE Tag Team Triple Crown winners, The Revival were on a two-man mission to make tag team wrestling relevant in WWE once more. The Revivals were as ruthless as they were tactical and brought a delightfully old-school mentality to main roster WWE. But despite this, life on the main roster didn't go as smoothly as it should, and The Revival said F this and asked for their release. But they stuck it out and eventually won gold, defeating champions Rude and Gable, dropped the belts to Hawkins and Ryder at WrestleMania 35, then won them back two months later. More bad booking came before the two jumped to SmackDown and straight into a feud with The New Day, culminating in a quick 54-day run with SmackDown's tag titles before they said F this once more and went to AEW. Number 23, The Dream Team. Look at these handsome men. This team of stunners. Clearly anyone's dream, eh? Okay, so Brutus Beefcake and Greg 
Patrick Valentine weren't going to graduate from the Finn Balor School of Modeling, but they did effectively reign as WWE Tag Champions, beating the US Express at Philadelphia's legendary Spectrum thanks to Beefcake rubbing a lit cigar in Barry Windham's eye. Valentine was already one of the most hated heels in the entire company, and with Beefcake joining him, the two were the type of champs you just wished would get their asses kicked, but rarely did. For the majority of their reign, the Dream Team clung to the gold using any methods they could, much to the ire of their main rivals, the British Bulldogs. Feeling invincible, the Dream Team and manager Johnny V gave the Bulldogs one last shot at the gold at WrestleMania 2, but fell to Dynamite and Davy Boy, who had Ozzy Osbourne with them, for some reason. Number 22, the Quebecers. Despite looking like Mounties, dressing like Mounties, and featuring the Mountie, the Quebecers were not in fact Mounties. Well, so says this pamphlet from the Canadian Tourism Board anyway. Regardless of their professions, Jacques and Pierre ruled the WWE tag division as the new generation era took flight, with three reigns as champions throughout 93 and 94, kicking off when they shadily defeated the Steiner brothers on Raw. Their biggest scalp came when they beat the team of Bret and Owen Hart at Royal Rumble 94, going alongside other successful title defenses like the count-out loss to Men on a Mission at WrestleMania 10. True, most of their wins were underhanded thanks to Johnny I wish I was wearing jean shorts and a black t-shirt polo in their corner, and true, they actually lost the belts to Mabel's hefty arse at a house show, but for fans of a certain age, the Quebecers were THE heel tag team. Number 21, Owen Hart and Yokozuna. After kicking Bret Hart's leg out of his leg, Owen Hart had nothing to do, so convinced former WWE champion Yokozuna to team up. That's a pretty good strategy, isn't it? And it worked, winning the tag titles in their first ever match by turning the smoking guns into paste at WrestleMania 11, Owen and Yokozuna became the linchpins of the villainous Camp Cornets. The guns, the allied powers, the head shrinkers, all were swatted away with ease, until they just had to face WWE Champ Diesel and IC Champ Shawn Michaels in a winner-takes-all match at In Your House 3. Despite Diesel pinning Owen for the belts, it didn't count, as Owen wasn't supposed to be in the match, having been replaced by Davy Boy Smith. Owen and Yoko rejoiced as they were reinstated as tag champions for about 30 minutes until dropping them to the Smoking Guns. Number 20, the Smoking Guns. Cowboys who wrestle with actual hats and guns must be in the new generation as the combo of Billy and Bart Gunn rode their way into WWE in 1993. It would almost be two years until the guns held gold though, usurping the 123 Kid and Bob Holly the day after they won the straps and holding them until WrestleMania 11 when they were felled by Camp Cornette. The guns eventually got their revenge and their title titles five months later, enjoying a long reign with wins over the likes of the 123 Kid and Razor Ramon and the Body Donners before vacating the belts due to injury. After a couple of months of rehab, Billy and Bart were back for title reign three, lifting the gold from the Godwins and defending them against reams of jobbers, including a young Matt and Jeff Hardy. Eventually, success got to Billy's head, and after losing manager Sonny and the titles in September 1996, the guns went their separate ways to, well, differing levels of career success. Number 19, The Street Profits. The second ever WWE Triple Crown Tag Title winners, the Street Profits have already achieved a lot in their relatively short run on the main roster. Officially being called up to Raw in October 2019, the Profits had to wait until March 2020 before lifting their first titles, defeating Seth Rollins and Buddy Murphy. Montez Ford and Angelo Dawkins then defeated pretty much every team in the division, Angel Garza and Austin Theory at WrestleMania, the Viking Raiders after that weird game of one-upsmanship they had, and Andrade and Angel Garza at SummerSlam. Draft time and the two went over to SmackDown, swapping the titles with the New Day on their way out. This ended their Raw Tag Titles run at a hefty 224 days, the ninth highest amount of days as champs in the title's history. Their SmackDown title run wasn't as impressive, lasting 88 days with the straps until losing them to those dirty dogs, but to have a combined 300 plus day reign in modern WWE in your first year no less is nothing to be sniffed at. Number 18, the world's greatest tag team. 
Whilst WWE Champion in 2002, Wrestling Machine Kurt Angle was gifted fellow Wrestling Machines Charlie Haas and Shelton Benjamin by Paul Heyman to serve as his personal understudies. Dubbed Team Angle, it wasn't long until the trio had suplexed everything on SmackDown. Rather than lackeys in singlets, Team Angle were allowed to do what they did best, wrestle, and soon earned rave reviews for the Crispin ring work, defeating tag champs Los Guerreros after a handful of months on the main roster. Haas and Benjamin would defend against anyone and everyone, but found themselves warring with Los Guerreros time and time again. Despite successfully defending against them and Chris Benoit and Rhino at WrestleMania 19, Eddie and Tajiri would eventually take the titles from Haas and Benjamin at Judgment Day. The duo left Kurt Angle and continued on their path of technical dominance, first under the name The Best Damn Tag Team Period, and then the self-proclaimed World's Greatest Tag Team. Soon after the rebrand, they regained the belts and battled the likes of Ray and Kidman and the APA before losing them to, well, who else? Los Guerreros. The team split and then reformed on Raw a couple of years later, but were unable to win a championship. Number 17, Eminem. Eminem's time together was brief, but it kicked off in superb style with a WWE tag title win over Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero on their TV debut in 2005. The team of Joey Mercury and Johnny Nitro with Melina was seen as the next logical step for WWE's tag team identity, merging the athletics of the Hardys and the arrogance of Edge and Christian. As champions, Eminem were treated as the real deal, registering 291 days as champs across three reigns in just over a year. There were missteps, of course, losing the straps to Animal and Heidenreich and Rey and Batista, but these aside, Eminem were clearly positioned as the team to usher in the new era and beat practically every team that was put in front of them across SmackDown, pay-per-view, and hell, even Velocity. But everything has to come to an end, and after losing a series of matches to London and Kendrick, Eminem dropped the titles to the high-flying hooligans and broke up. Nitro and Mercury would have a second short run, but it wasn't quite as memorable outside of Joey getting a horrendous injury in that infamous ladder match. Number 16, Team Hell No. Out of all the odd couple teams in history, none were as over as Team Hell No. Bonded by an aggressive hatred of one another, Daniel Bryan and Kane were forced to team together to help sort out their differences, alongside an extensive course of therapy. Somehow, they bickered their way to the tag titles, defeating Kofi Kingston and R-Truth at Night of Champions 2012, and each man took sole credit for the win, declaring, I am the tag team champions. They battled the likes of the primetime players, Dolph Ziggler and Big E and Team Road Scholars. Why weren't they just called the Road Scholars? Kane and Brian reigned as tag champions for 245 days and were routinely positioned as a strong force to be reckoned with, rather than fodder for other main eventers to steamroll. They shortly ran into the dominant force that is the Shield and despite getting several licks in, lost the belts to Seth and Roman at Extreme Rules 2013. Team Hell No are an example that WWE can still push a babyface tag team properly when they can be be bothered. And oh yeah, this tag run kind of turned Daniel Bryan into the hottest wrestler on the planet. No big deal. Number 15, The Nasty Boys. The Nasty Boys made a lot of noise when they turned up in WWE in 1990 to nastasize the place, whatever the hell that means, and quickly ended up as number one contenders to the tag titles. With that sniveling rat Jimmy Hart in their corner, their no-nonsense attitude made them easily hateable. This was emphasized when they cheated the Hart Foundation out of the titles at WrestleMania 7 and effectively ended the team of the Hitman and the Anvil. A pair of rough thugs who were WWE's equivalent to Bebop and Rocksteady the Nasties did everything in their power to keep their mitts on the gold. Whether it was blasting people with chairs, Jimmy's megaphone, or even his, uh, <laughs> helmet, none of WWE's valiant babyfaces could outwit or outnasty them. But unfortunately for Knobs and Sags, they shared a division with the Legion of Doom. The two teams often battled each other, and as one of the only teams in America not afraid to work as snug with the Warriors as they did with everyone else, it made for some amazing tooth-rattling battles. Battles. After far too many DQs, a street fight for the gold was set for SummerSlam 1991, and after 155 days as champs, the Nasty Boys' reign was over. Number 14, The Bar. 
They're European, they love a pint and a fight, it's the bar! Like many, many others on this list, Seamus and Cesaro started teaming after initially fighting each other week after week without mercy, and after being thrust together by Mick Foley, realised that they were two sides of the same coin. While most of us expected this to be a short-lived pairing, the tandem stuck together for nearly three years, with five reigns as tag champs across Raw and SmackDown. Their first reign started in the biggest way possible, by ending the New Day's record-breaking title run at Roadblock End of the Line. They battled the Hardys, the club, Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins, and yes, even a ten-year-old boy. The Bar's one and only SmackDown title run came at the New Day's expense too, defeating them for the straps on SmackDown 1000 as Big Show turned heel for the 300th time. The Bar was the perfect pairing at the perfect time. It gave the Celtic Warrior a new lease of life and utilised the Swiss Superman properly for a change. Number 13, Money Inc. After years of trying to buy the WWE title to no avail, Ted DiBiase collared IRS and the two bribed their way into a tag title shot instead. They bought the services of Jimmy Hart, manager to the number one contenders, the Natural Disasters, who brought the Disasters title contract with him. A short time later and Money Inc. were champions, defeating the Legion of Doom at a house show for the honour before the team had even debuted on WWE television. As you can probably imagine, Ted and Irwin did everything in their their powers to escape with the gold time and time again, usually just throwing money about like I do during a trip to Blackpool Pleasure Beach. But eventually they lost the straps after 164 days to the natural disasters. After a bit more back and forth with the LOD, Money Inc. started reign number two, beating the disasters on Wrestling Challenge in October 1992. This reign was far more impressive, with the two defeating a returning Hulk Hogan and Brutus Beefcake at WrestleMania 9 on a technicality, obviously. Finally, after 244 days, Money Inc. put over new team on the block, the Steiner Brothers, for two whole days, then regained the belts for three, dropped them back to the Steiners, and that was that. Number 12, Miz and Morrison. One of the true bright sparks of WWE's ECW was the emergence of The Miz and John Morrison. Former rivals over the ECW title, the two joined forces in November 2007 to defeat MVP and Matt Hardy for the SmackDown tag titles and brought them home to ECW. The two had that IT factor about them, utilising their dirt sheet online series to get themselves over, whilst defending the titles across SmackDown, ECW and pay-per-view, and scooping up a ton of best tag team awards along the way. After 250 days, they dropped the belts in a four-way without being pinned, feuded with DX, then moved to Raw, yoinking the tag titles from Kofi Kingston and CM Punk. Whilst this reign was nothing on their SmackDown tag title reign, it further established the pair as two of the most exciting talents in WWE. The inevitable split happened as the two chased singles gold, then in 2011, Morrison said FIA and left the WWE. When the Shaman of Sexy eventually returned in January 2020, Miz and Morrison reformed, winning the SmackDown tag titles a month later. Successful defences in the Elimination Chamber and the weird triple threat ladder match at WrestleMania 36 followed, until the Miz heartbreakingly turned on his drippy pal. Number 11, Owen Hart and the British Bulldog. After flailing as part of the Allied Powers with Lex Luger, Davey Boy Smith said bollocks to it, turned heel for the first time in WWE, and joined Owen Hart in Camp Cornette. The two eventually left Cornette, won the tag titles from the Smoking Guns at In Your House 10, and would have a long 246 day reign with the gold. With the power of Bulldog and technique of Owen, the pair was like an updated British Bulldogs or Hart Foundation, and defended against the likes of Shawn Michaels and Psycho Sid, Furnace and Lafon, the Legion of of Doom and Mankind and Vader. Owen and Bulldog looked like they were on the verge of breaking apart, exacerbated by Bulldog defeating the Rocket to become the inaugural European champion, but Bret Hart talked sense into them and reformed the Hart Foundation. The Foundation went on to take over WWE, Bret holding the world title whilst Owen and Bulldog held the tag titles, European title, IC title, and a couple of slammies too, all at the same time. To say they were dominant is a huge understatement, utilising any means necessary to keep hold of their prizes and helping Brett brutalise Shawn Michaels and Steve Austin in the process. Number 10, The British Bulldogs One of the most celebrated tag teams of all time, the British Bulldogs brought a new dynamic to tag wrestling that had seldom been seen before. Combined 
Combining the might of Davy Boy Smith and the innovative junior heavyweight style of Dynamite Kid, the Bulldogs honed their skills in Stampede Wrestling, New Japan, and All Japan before coming to WWE. Before long, the Bulldogs crossed the paths of Tag Champs The Dream Team and engaged in a long and frustrating feud, with the champs routinely escaping with the gold. Heading into WrestleMania 2, the Bulldogs had one last shot at the belt and picked up the win flanked by Lou Albano and Ozzy Osbourne. As champions, the Bulldogs put on clinics with anyone who faced them, successfully defending against Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov, the Moondogs, the Funks, and the Hart Foundation. Unfortunately, Dynamite's breakneck in-ring style took its toll on his body, and a back injury put him on the shelf in late 1986. When Dynamite returned, he was really in no state to wrestle, and during a tag title defense against the Hart Foundation, he was KO'd by Jimmy Hart's megaphone. A valiant Davy flew solo, but succumbed to the foundation and corrupt ref Danny Davis. Number 9. The Hardy Boys Again, if this was a list of the best tag teams of all time, then the Hardys would be a shoe in for one of the top spots, but they were far, far better when chasing tag titles than they ever were as champs. Indeed, during their Attitude Era Prime, they reigned as five-time WWE Tag Champions, but with a combined reign of 88 days, this averages out at around 17 days per run. But let's focus focus on the positives, the Hardys were innovators. They were one of the cornerstones of WWE's golden tag division era with the Dudleys and Edge and Christian, and were easily one of the most popular acts of the day. They're also the only team in WWE history to hold all three major tag titles and the WWE sanctioned WCW tag titles with nine reigns across the 90s, 2000s, and 2010s. Arguably, it was the Hardys' return title win at WrestleMania 33 that was the best of their career. And I should know since I was there throwing my $15 Coors Light beer in the air with glee. Surprise entrance in a four-team ladder match, the crowd erupted when Matt plucked the Raw tag titles down, the only tag title win for the team at a major pay-per-view. Number 8. The Legion of Doom Vince McMahon utterly craved the Road Warriors in the late 80s and in their absence pushed several teams in an attempt to tap into their face-painted heavy metal glory. Luckily, McMahon's prayers were answered in 1990 when Hawk and Animal rode their bikes into WWE and straight to the top of the card. After dispatching Demolition, LOD went after tag champs the Nasty Boys, surviving the trip to Pity City to win gold at SummerSlam 1991, becoming the only team to hold the AWA, NWA, and WWE World Tag Team Championships. As champions, LOD were positioned very strongly, probably because they would have battered WWE management if they weren't, feuding with the Nasties and the Natural Disasters before dropping the titles to Money Inc. and leaving WWE. Cut to 1997 and the returning LOD once again resumed their path of destruction, smashing through the Headbangers and the Nation of Domination before teaming with Steve Austin in his war against the Hart Foundation. Re-established as the top dogs, Hawk and Animal became two-time champions after defeating the Godwins before dropping the titles to the upstart New Age Outlaws 48 days later. Number 7. The Usos the story of the Usos in the tag title scene is a tale of two teams. For their two reigns as Raw Tag Champions in 2014, it was a case of the talented but bland babyface twins overcoming all oncomers to very little fanfare. But it was when Jimmy and Jay jumped to SmackDown in 2016 that their fortunes improved, turning heel and inviting everyone into the Uso penitentiary. This was the Usos with bite. Gone was the face paint and the smiling, in was an air of we will beat you just for looking at us the wrong way, kicked off by defeating American Alpha for the titles on SmackDown in March 2017. As champs, the Usos were on a collision course with The New Day, engaging in one of the best tag feuds the WWE has ever promoted. The two teams traded the titles for the rest of 2017, engaging in street fights and a Hell in a Cell match in an attempt to assert dominance. After four reigns with the gold, the pair turned face, jumped to Raw, did very little, came back to SmackDown, and eventually stood by Roman Reigns' side as the villainous bloodline. As of writing, the Usos are in their fifth run with the SmackDown belt, Belts and solidly a part of the main event scene. Number 6. The New Age Outlaws Oh, you didn't know that the New Age Outlaws would rank at number 6 on our list? 
Come on now. Beginning life as merely something to do for floundering lower carders Rockabilly and Jesse James, the New Age Outlaws soon became one of the most overacts in the entire industry. They were brash, cocky, and weren't afraid of throwing a couple of lads in a bin and chucking it off the stage. Road Dogg's charisma and Gunn's athleticism made them a must-see attraction. Five-time WWE champions in their first run together, the Outlaws became the must-see tag team of the early Attitude Era, their popular going to new heights when they joined D-Generation X. At the end of their five reigns, they had a combined 468 days as champions, the fourth most in the title's history, before dropping the gold to the Dudley boys and allowing a new crop to take the reins of the division. 14 years later, after a stint being weird in TNA, the Outlaws returned to a monster ovation, quickly turned heel, and took the Raw tag titles off the Dust Brothers for a short and harmless 37-day nostalgia run. Number 5. Demolition Whilst unfairly labelled a Road Warriors ripoff in their early days, Demolition carved out their own path, standing as one of the most successful teams in WWE history. Three-time tag champions, the duo of Axe and Smash have the most combined days with the classic straps, with their legendary first reign the longest single tag title reign in company history, a record which stood for 28 years until it was broken by the New Day in 2016. Imposing, cool, and utterly dominant, Demolition started as they meant to go on, dismantling tag champion Strike Force for the gold at WrestleMania 4. With the dastardly Mr. Fuji in their corner, they escaped with the belts time and time again, sweeping aside the Hart Foundation, the British Bulldogs, and others before turning face and doing more of the same to the Powers of Pain, the Twin Towers, and various jobbers. After 478 days, Demolition caught the ire of the Heenan family and dropped the belts to the Brain Busters. They regained them a couple of months later, but lost them to Heenan family members, the Colossal Connection. A third and final reign saw Crush join the action, but with the Legion of Doom's arrival to the WWE imminent, Demolition were turned heel and lost all their luster. Number 4. Edge and Christian Seven-time tag team champions, never mind a literal boatload of singles titles, Edge and Christian were one of WWE's hottest commodities when the tag scene went through the stratosphere in the Attitude Era. They were at times ridiculous and ruthless, comedic and serious, a pair of dweeby airheads with kazoos, or brooding former vampires. Versatile, I believe they call it in Latin. Regardless, their wars with the Dudleys and the Hardys made them household names, with their matches almost guaranteed to steal whatever show they were on. The strength of ENC's reigns lay in how they won the titles, winning their first at WrestleMania 2000 in the Triangle Ladder Match, and the last in one of the greatest matches of all time, TLC 2, never mind a successful defense in the inaugural TLC at SummerSlam 2000. The only downside is that their reigns weren't very long, with all seven runs clocking in at a combined 206 days. But again, this was the Attitude Era, and quick reigns were as common as Vince McMahon hitting the bench press at 3am. The hot shotting of the belts led to some memorable moments, like Los Conquistadors winning the titles on Edge and Christian's behalf, whilst ridiculous gimmicks like the five-second poses made you want to throttle them. And it all totally reeked of awesomeness. Number 3. The Heart Foundation Arguably the prototypical tag team of WWE, the Hart Foundation was the perfect blend of strength, speed, technicality, and ferociousness, as the Anvil and the Hitman tore their way through WWE's tag division in the 80s, setting Brett up to lead the company during the New Generation era. Wars with the British Bulldogs, the Rockers, and Strike Force helped make WWE's tag division one of the most exciting aspects of the entire promotion in the 80s and 90s, and the Foundation stand as the third third longest reigning tag champs with the classic belts, with 483 days at the top across two reigns. And both reigns were great in their own right. The first had the ruthless tandem use any means necessary to keep hold of the gold, whilst the second saw the heroic pink and black attack outclass whoever stepped in the ring with them. By the time Anvil and Hitman's second run ended at the hands of the Nasty Boys and former manager Jimmy Hart, there was really nothing left for them to do. Brett made his way up the ranks whilst Anvil would go on to form the bang average new foundation with Rocket Owen Hart. Number 2. The Dudley Boys 
Arguably the most decorated tag team in wrestling history, the Dudley Boys are also one of the most decorated tag teams in WWE history, with one WCW tag title reign, one WWE tag title reign, and a record-breaking eight classic WWE world tag title reigns. Ending the New Age Outlaws reign in February 2000, the Dudleys asserted their dominance over the division by literally putting anyone they saw through a table. Whether foes like Edge and Christian and the Hunt Hardys or bystanders like Mae Young, the Dudley's appetite for destruction made them immensely popular. Bubba and Devon have the distinction of heading into both the Triangle Ladder Match and TLC2 as champions, but failed to leave with the gold, a small price to pay when going down in history, I'm sure. That said, they did have the last ever WCW tag title run, so I'm sure that sent them back to Dudleyville with smiles on their lovely faces. After the glory days of the golden age of tag wrestling died down, the Dudleys broke up in the inaugural draft splits. Thankfully though, they later reunited and had three more tag title runs across Raw and SmackDown before leaving WWE and gobbling up every single tag title they could find. Number 1. The New Day the longest reigning combined tag team champions with the most individual reigns, never mind the longest single reign, if there's a tag team record in WWE, then chances are the New Day have broken it. I mean, 11 tag title reigns and 1,000 days as champions in a seven year period is incredible, doubly so considering the go away heat the trio were met with when they debuted. But with a trombone and a little power of positivity, the New Day became one of the most entertaining acts in WWE, whether oblivious heels or innuendo riddled babyfaces with a love of cereal, pancakes, waffles, and various other breakfast foods. Out of all 11 of New Day's title reigns, it was their second reign with the Raw tag titles that was the most historic. Defeating the primetime players Los Matadores and the Lucha Dragons at SummerSlam 2015, the New Day embarked on a 483 day long title reign, shattering Demolition's 28 year record. The only real criticism of the New Day's numerous reigns is that WWE failed to adequately build a division outside of the New Day and the Usos, but can you blame WWE for sticking with Kofi, Woods, and E? No matter where and when they were champions, the New Day always delivered, beating just about every team in WWE and participating in almost every match available. Today they continue to sell a landfill full of merchandise, are universally adored, and a first ballot Hall of Famers. What more can I say?